You are listening to the Visualizing War podcast. In each episode, we talk about representations of war in art, text, film, and music. With new guests each time, we look at how people have described or imagined war in different periods and places, and we discuss the impact which war stories have on us as individuals and societies. Hello, my name is Alice Koenig, and I co-direct the Visualizing War project at the University of St. Andrews. My guests today are award-winning composer Anthony Ritchie, and biographer, librettist, and broadcaster, Kate Kennedy. Currently Associate Professor of Music at Otago University, Anthony began composing in the 1980s, and he has been commissioned to write a huge variety of works over the years for symphony orchestras, choirs, and smaller ensembles. He has a long string of recordings to his name, and his music has won acclaim all around the world. Kate will be familiar to some listeners from her regular broadcasts on BBC Radio 3, She's a musician herself, a Baroque cellist, but she's also an academic who works on the music and literature of the early 20th century, particularly the First World War. Her latest book came out in June, a biography of the poet and composer Ivor Gurney, whose experiences in the trenches inspired a lot of his material. We'll be talking a bit about Ivor Gurney later as we delve into musical commemorations and critiques of war. But what brings Kate and Anthony together is the fact that Kate worked on Anthony's highly acclaimed oratorio, Gallipoli to the Somme, a reflection on World War I composed in 2016, ahead of the centenary commemorations of the First World War. We're gonna have a chance to listen to some of this amazing work as we talk about the challenges and opportunities of representing war in music. We've delved a little bit into this on the Visualizing War podcast already when we interviewed Susan Verby and Kirstein Volness about their opera, Letters You Will Not Get, Women's Voices from the Great War. And the richness of that work has really inspired us to dive more into musical visualizations of war and what they do to us. Kate and Anthony are really the perfect guests to talk about this because in their different ways, they've both thought a lot about how to represent war in words and music. So Anthony, Kate, thank you very much for sparing the time to talk to me today and welcome to the Visualising War podcast. Thank Thank you, you, Alice. So, as I said, we're going to talk a bit about your oratorio, Gallipoli to the Somme, in a minute, Anthony. But I wonder if we can start by talking more generally about our shared habits of visualising World War I. And I should say, perhaps before we do that, that this podcast is part of a mini series focused on representations of World War I and World War II. So next week, we're going to be talking to curators at the Imperial War Museum in London about the decisions that they took in 2014 when they redesigned their World War I galleries. And then in a couple of weeks time, we're going to be talking to them again about their new World War II galleries. What they've experienced and what they're going to be talking about is the fact that how we remember these historic conflicts really changes over time and varies a lot from place to place. So if we can start with you, Anthony, you're based in New Zealand. And it would just yes. be interesting to know how World War I tends to be remembered or visualised in your part of the world. Yes, the Gallipoli campaign looms large in the, in the national psyche. In fact, it's often said that at Gallipoli, New Zealand came of age and that started our sort of independence uh, drive, if you like, away from the British colonial rule. So every year, you know, the, there's this almost a pilgrimage to Gallipoli amongst people. Although, of course, with COVID, that's come to a grinding halt. So a lot of people do that. But generally in New Zealand itself, the, the dawn services are very popular and are widely covered on the news every year. Also, uh, I would say in, there's, there's more sort of visual engagement. So during the, the commemorations of the war, we had uh, several visual exhibitions one at the national one, uh, Te Papa, which Peter Jackson, the filmmaker, helped to put together a very graphic sort of portrayal of life in the trenches and so forth. And of course, you know, the various films and docos, uh, still plenty of books coming out to commemorate uh, the war. But very much a focus on New Zealand's part on, on Gallipoli and then Anzac Day and so on. Kate, yep. how does that compare with British habits then of remembering and representing World War I? Do we draw on different sources, different texts, different material? Um, and and are, our, are our folky different as well? I think, I think they must be. I think for us, the moment, or at least in the myths that have uh, arisen around the war since 1918, it's the first day of the Somme for us. That, that's our, our big moment. That's what people, people think of when they, they think of the war. 
But I think the thing really, and certainly in terms of culture, that's shaped the way that we've inherited an understanding of the war is the literature, much more so than the music, which, which perversely is why I'm so fascinated by the music. It, it is seen certainly in Britain as the most literary war in history. And we've inherited our understanding of it through the words of very specific, usually dissenting officer class poets, you know, Wilfred Owen, Siegfried Sassoon, Edmund Blunden, Robert Graves. Uh, there is a very small clique almost of canon of war poets through whose eyes we view the war. And, and also in the way that it's been anthologized, even to the degree of the shapes in which these poets are presented in an anthology from the eager to sign up in 1914 to, oh God, make it stop, quoting Sassoon, um, by about 1916, and then the war of attrition by 1918, and then this kind of numb, traumatized aftermath. And, and that is the shape that you find in anthologies like Up the Line to Death, for instance, these, these sort of big canonical anthologies that I inherited as a child that came out in the 60s. And until really in the last 20 years or so, that was the shape of our understanding of the First World War. And only in the last couple of decades, we started to think about middlebrow writers or women writers or anybody who isn't white British male writers. And and within that has come an, an interest in what other art forms had to say about the war, particularly about commemoration, which is something that I'm particularly interested in. And and so we start to think about what, what classical music meant for particularly British composers, how they responded, uh, how they articulated their wars either on the spot or afterwards when they had time to, to come back and think about it. But actually, interestingly, if the, the other element that we've really inherited very strongly is popular music. So while we see the war through the eyes of Wilfred Owen, we also see it through It's a Long Way to Tipperary and Trench Song. And that's, that, in a sense, has been kept quite separate as a separate genre. and. Uh, and one of the things that's very interesting, particularly about the, the fantastic work that Anthony's done with Gallipoli to the Somme, is that he's combined a number of different genres and, and brought these two together because it's very odd that there is this artificial separation between trench music, popular music, and the, the elite classical highbrow. And they're kept artificially separate now. They weren't anything like that separate in people's experience of the war. You find people like the composer Arthur Bliss's brother, Kennard Bliss, who was a wonderful musician in his own right, who was killed on the Somme, writing letters home saying he wants more records of Berlioz to play on his trench gramophone because the private soldiers around him are putting their heads down in the straw in the barn, weeping when they hear Berlioz. And, but they're also singing trench song as well, which is fairly bawdy and, and a lot less highbrow. There isn't quite that distinction in the way that war is experienced musically and yet we seem to keep them artificially separate now. That's very interesting. As you say, the sort of siloing of the different representations and manifestations of literature, song, all sorts of different kinds of music, which I suppose perhaps partly as academics, we have separated off and studied in separate ways. Kate, I wonder if you could dig us in a little bit more to the literary representations and the musical representations of World War I by telling us about some of the less well-known figures of this era. So you mentioned Siegfried Sassoon, people have heard of Wilfred Owen, but you've recently, as I said in the introduction, you've recently published a biography about Ivor Gurney, Dweller in Shadows is the title, who was a poet and a composer, one I don't think many people have heard of. Can you tell us a bit about his poetry, his song, and what that tells us about contemporary representations or contemporary responses to World War I? Yeah, absolutely. So Gurney, I mean, and I would say this is completely fascinating. <laughs> I mean, he has fascinated me for a good 15 years. He is this very, very unusual combination of an equally brilliant composer and poet. And it's because he thinks across two genres all the time. And one morning he'll write a poem and the afternoon he'll write a song. And so there is this extraordinary synthesis going on between text and music in, in his brain. He was known, I think the quote was from an editor at the time as one of the best young men below the horizon and that tends to be where he's remained 
he was just coming into his own as the war broke out. He was an undergraduate at the Royal College of Music. He um, signed up along with this golden generation who were cut down by the war. Arthur Bliss, again, talks about the war as being the kind of crash of the European war and our beaches sucked us all into its undertow without us ever probing the consequences. I think he puts it, this, this idea of this, of this suction of they all drawn out from Kensington, from the Royal College and into the trenches. And it really was rather like that. So Gurney had just started to make his name. He'd written some extraordinary songs that are still much loved, a, a song called Sleep, particularly, he wrote as a second year undergraduate. Finding his voice musically ended up in the trenches and quite unusually wrote songs in the trenches, which due to practicalities as much as anything else, how do you carry a large manuscript book around with you in a knapsack is very unusual. So there are these four or five songs that he writes on the spot, almost like journalism or the way that the war poets respond, where it is an instant outpouring. But he also, for expediency sake as much as anything, becomes a war poet at the same time. So while he is thinking through what death means, what homesickness means, appropriating other people's poetry to explore those ideas and setting it through music, he's also finding that verse comes like, like buttermilk from a jug, as he puts it. It just sort of pours out of him. And he moves from the fairly stereotypical sort of Keatsian, like early Wilfred Owen, you know, derivative poetry of his very first attempts quite quickly into a voice that is interestingly modernist, wrong-footing, quirky, very, very musical, but in unexpected ways, piles image upon image and drills down to the meticulous detail of trench life. So you don't get these great overblown statements. You get the smell of bacon cooking on a Tommy cooker or what the cabbage fields look like as you march past Ypres, these kinds of details. And then these very complicated wrestlings with some of the big concepts like Mother England, what it means to be sent out by your country, who you love, who you're supposed to serve, and to be destroyed by it, and what that country then owes you when you come back. So very difficult stuff that he's working through, taking on archetypes and embracing and attacking them, taking them to task. And then when he returns from the trenches for four years, he writes some phenomenal poetry and music, a lot of which is responding to the war. There's a wonderful song cycle called Ludlow and Teen, which sets A. E. Hausman's poetry very all about the lovely lads in the hundreds come in from the fair and we watch these lads march off through the English pastoral world through to the trenches. In fact, not the houseman knew that because this is actually 1896, but these lads are all going off to die and it's very beautiful and it's very glorious and it's very hard to understand how Gurney could even want to set this stuff in 1919 when he's tried to commit suicide and he's actually on a ward in, in a mental hospital at the time. And yet he does. And so, and again, that's perennially fascinating to me that he is not actually rejecting ideas of heroism and glory and the nostalgia for the men around him or the fact that there is a grandeur associated with war and premature death. He is embracing that, but he's also infinitely complicating it all the time across music and across poetry and exploring it with undercutting and undermining through the way that he might set Hausman's words. But then by 1922, he had a second really breakdown. He'd already fallen apart when at the Royal College, he joined up, joined the army in order to hold himself together, which as his sister rather wonderfully said, would have been a great idea had he not had to go to war, which of course is, is an occupational hazard in 1915. But by 1922, he was hearing voices. He was sitting with a cushion on his head to ward off the electrical waves. He was going around asking for a revolver with which to shoot himself and was certified insane and was locked up in asylums for the remaining 15 years of his life during which time, and again, kind of fascinating and pretty sure unique, he remained a war poet because people like Robert Graves could say goodbye to all that, as, as he titles his war memoir. And in the sort of decade gap between the end of the war and people being able to process it to sort of sublimate their experiences and write the big war memoirs that come out between 1928 and 1933, Testament of Youth, um, Memoirs of an Infantry Officer, these, these kind of you know, canonical books. They can afford to say goodbye to all that because they have a future. Gurney is writing into a vacuum. He knows he's never going to get out of the asylum and he cannot afford to lose any part of his pre-asylum identity. So he lives in the war still. He, and his war poetry gets better and better. 
until he really is one of the greatest war poets but the majority of it still remains unpublished so we can't yet fully assess what his poetry looks like as a body and neither can we assess what his music looks like as a body but it is endlessly fascinating and responding to the war and reassessing it and reimagining it through the 1920s and it speaks to trauma and it speaks to suffering it speaks to how experience changes over time and how we revisit it and how these memories adapt and shape and reorganize themselves around each other that's a, a fantastic introduction to gurney and hopefully makes many listeners not just me want to dive into his work and what I'm hearing from you is that while some of the other war poets experienced or, or sort of managed to find a sort of degree of closure, Gurney, as you say, revisits and revisits. And it sounds like his poetry and his song is an incredibly complex set of materials and set of responses to the war, perhaps increasingly complex as time mm. goes on. So yeah. I suppose the, the obvious question is, why don't we read and listen to Gurney in the same way that we do some of the better known war poets? quite simply because he was locked in an asylum and no one was publishing his stuff and he didn't have any money to get it out there it's down to economics as much as anything else and availability he wasn't in a position to edit his own manuscripts he wasn't in a position to promote them had he been we would we would know gurney and he is taught in schools he is known and loved by musicians and he is one of the war poets who you will find in most of the anthologies it's just as i say he's always slightly below the horizon he's always a a slightly peripheral presence and that's simply due to the fact that the vast majority of his work hasn't yet been seen by more than a handful of people and so what kind of impact do you think reading more Gurney would have on our habits of visualising World War I? You've talked about this sort of mix of big, big concepts, really complex ideas, and the meticulous detail of the smell of cabbages and so on. I think the thing for me is that because Gurney has this extraordinarily interesting vantage point as poet composer what he gives us is a way of visualizing war that perfectly blends um, words and music so in something like Ludlow and team he's able to build in all the complicated deeply traumatized difficult psychology that we might expect to find in really top-notch war poetry into music by drawing on the text and, and as I say by embracing and attacking it so we have moments where there is a kind of death instinct in the music and a life instinct which echoes what's going on in the poetry it's a vivacious young yeoman and there's a blackbird who's saying lie down lie down young yeoman what used to rise and rise you, you might as well be dead basically you're going to be anyway and and gurney overpowers one with the other so for him unlike the poem the death instinct is is overwhelming and it's it's frightening to listen to and by the end it's it's almost like a plane in turbulence by the end of the song cycle he's managed to write that imbalance and somehow finds a kind of way of existing a way of holding what he knows what his war experience is alongside the will to live and the will to to celebrate the beautiful and the sublime but then on that very rocky journey, he explores military rhythms that just about hold the song and the singer together. And then he has moments where he deliberately derails his own song. And they happen to be whenever Hausman is contemplating something that we might do you know, with a slight cliche called the reality of war. So a line such as lovely lads and dead and rotten. It, it, the piano part goes crazy and so does the string quartet and so does the singer. And it, there's no sense of where the bar lines are. We don't know what's going on. And then suddenly these kind of military drumming rhythms pull everyone back together. And it, it is a metaphor for Gurney himself being held together by the routines of war, the, the kind of becoming an automaton in order to survive with any kind of sense of your psychology intact. So for me, that's, you know, that's a long winded answer. But I think what Gurney can do is work on two levels, an incredibly complicated way to be able to give us a sense, even without us really knowing that we're hearing it, of listening to someone trying to make sense of this, because ultimately this is what these works are doing. They are trying to make sense of something that exists in fragments and across trauma and in ways that is very difficult to articulate. And again, the great works from the big requiems, the big pieces commemorating war, are all works that are trying to do that on a large scale. And perhaps the Song Cycle Ludlow and Team is one of the first of these. And it is a long legacy that reaches through the 20th century from Gurney to Arthur Bliss and 
to Frank Bridge, to Elgar, to Benjamin Britten and to Anthony Ritchie. <laughs> so yeah. that's, uh, it's absolutely fascinating. So yeah, so you're, you're sketching a really um, good picture there of the way in which words set to music can convey some of the complexity of conflict, of war experiences, of trauma and so on. And that does bring us neatly to talking a bit more about Anthony's work. So Anthony, the centenary commemorations of World War I obviously gave people an opportunity to revisit that very well-known conflict and take another look at it. This is something that a couple of our podcast guests have talked about on previous episodes. So, for example, we had the founder of the charity Never Such Innocence on at one point, and that was a charity that was set up to give children and young people a chance to reflect on World War I, but it's now grown much bigger because they discovered that, in fact, young people want to express their views on conflict in the 21st century too. One of the things that we've been coming up against is that when people have a chance that the centenary commemorations almost gave people an opportunity to look at something that was familiar, but to look at the war in ways that perhaps refreshed their understanding of it. So I suppose my question is, what was your experience of the centenary commemorations? Did they tend to reinforce how you had long viewed World War I? Or did they give you some new insights into World War I, the, the commemorations that you witnessed and saw coming together where you were based? Well, for me personally, I think it did change my views of it somewhat. I was, from a young age, always very anti-war. And in fact, I had a grandfather who went to the war who I never knew. But my grandmother did talk about it. But in the arrogance of youth, I didn't really want to hear much about it because of my very staunch anti-war views back then. And I kind of regret that in a way, in that I came to the commemorations feeling quite ignorant of a lot of aspects of it. And so this project gave me an excuse to read around, quite widely around World War One. So I, I learned a lot through the whole process. I think interesting you say about uh, younger people wanting to talk, you know, talk not just about World War One but contemporary conflicts, because there was a sense here that we shouldn't just be reveling in the past. We should be, you know, say, well, how does this impact today? And uh, I note that one of my colleagues, John Pasafis, created a work called uh, No Man's Land. Which was very visual work. Uh, it involved live musicians, but also uh, streamed around the world to other musicians who performed at various stages in the piece. And it was a reflection not just on World War One, but on all the current conflicts that are plaguing the world. And I thought that was quite a nice way of just reminding us it's not just about looking back at history, but it's what we learn and, and can apply today. Yeah, and music in that work, the it's called the No Man's Land Project. And in fact, listeners can find it on www.nomanslandproject.org. It was something which deliberately brought people from all around the world together. So bringing musicians and, and sort of doing global music making almost as an embodiment of hope, peace, um, this idea that music is one of the things that can bring people together as much as it might commemorate or help represent or help us visualise past conflict. Yep. So, Anthony, can you tell us a little bit about then how Gallipoli to the Somme came about? You know, what was the inspiration for it? And how did you end up putting together a commemoration for a war that, as you said, you actually perhaps had not had very much curiosity about growing up? Uh, I have to say, first of all, it was a commission work from the Dunedin Symphony Orchestra, so they asked me to write the piece. But before that, I'd actually been asked to write a, another work for a, a baritone, uh, Robert Tucker, focused on Gallipoli. So the piece is called Whispers of Gallipoli. That sort of spurred me into doing uh, quite a lot of research around the topic of World War I. I consulted quite a few people, including Kate, as he's here, but also historian Christopher Pugsley, who's a New Zealand war horse historian, who recommended quite a number of texts to me. So I did a lot of looking around to bring this piece together. I guess also I wanted to, to reflect on my own sort of personal associations with, with the war through via my grandfather, who was actually a musician. He was in a, a musical troupe called The Diggers, it was a sort of a personal aspect to it as well. Of course, the key inspiration was finding the figure of Alexander Aitken, who his story is threaded through Gallipoli to the Somme. And in fact, owe him the title, Gallipoli to the Somme, which is the name of his 1963 book, which uh, recalls his memoirs of being a soldier. <laughs> 
So Anthony, can you tell us a little bit more about Alexander Aitken then? As you say, he's the inspiration and it's his story that Gallipoli to the Somme is telling. Yes, well, uh, Alexander Aitken was quite a remarkable person. Uh, he had a, a photographic memory, fantastic at mathematics. In fact, he became the professor of mathematics at Edinburgh after the war. But he was also a very fine musician. Uh, he played a violin at a level where he could have played in a professional orchestra if he'd chosen to. He was also a composer. He composed a Gallipoli hymn and uh, some songs that we've had performed here. At one level, he was quite remarkable. At another level, he was just an ordinary soldier. And in fact, in his, his memoirs, he was at pains to make that point that he was just one of the, the guys, if you like, going and doing his bit. And he didn't regard what he did as remarkable. Uh, I wanted to get the sense of ordinary people's experience of the war. So I thought that Aitken expressed that very well in his book and his descriptions, which is, is quite a low key book about the war. And that's an attitude that I quite liked. So he ended up going to Gallipoli in 1915. He survived that and then was sent to the Somme. And actually he was wounded in the Goose Alley battle where 300 of his comrades from New Zealand also died that day. Do people connect that to the fact that he then went on to suffer sort of psychological breakdowns? Is that traced back to his experiences in the war or not? Well, yes, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that. The, the psychological breakdowns that he had, he, he never mentions in the book. And so it's not that well known, but it's only known through letters, unpublished letters that uh, were shared with me. His story came to light only at the time of the commemoration. So before that, he wasn't really known, particularly his book wasn't that well known. The story, I guess, of him taking a violin to the battle was an intriguing one. And the, the Aitken violin actually survived through Gallipoli and the Battle of the Somme. He lost it when he got wounded. But it somehow it made its way back through various hands, all the way back to New Zealand, and is now on display at Otago Boys High School <laughs> in Dunedin. And so that that lovely connection with a physical instrument is a cue that led me to including this in, in my piece. So I'm building a picture now of the trenches full of music and full of musicians from Gurney to Aitken and presumably many more. Kate, you were involved in helping Anthony do some of the research. Can you tell us a bit about your involvement? And also, perhaps you can help sketch a shape of the oratorio. Uh, really, my involvement was very, very much on the periphery. I was part of the commissioning process. Uh, my husband, Simon Ava, was the conductor who commissioned it. He is a Coventry boy. He grew up playing the organ in Coventry Cathedral, which was what Benjamin Britten's War Requiem was written for. Obviously, Coventry was flattened in the Second World War and the cathedral burnt down. It was a, a terrible moment and very, very symbolic and one that had a very profound effect sort of growing up in, in its legacy on Simon. So he'd always wanted to He's always been very involved with performing Britain's War Requiem. He's performed it in Coventry Cathedral many times and in London, and I believe also in Dresden. But he wanted to commission a work for Dunedin Symphony Orchestra, which he conducts. So it's a, an orchestra he loves, and he loves working out in New Zealand, that would be a link between England and New Zealand and would be a way of rethinking what, what the Requiem Mass or what, what a large choral orchestral work of commemoration might mean in relation to the war sort of standing on the shoulders of Britain, really. And so when the opportunity came about for for him to think about who that might be, he's he's always been very, very impressed with Anthony's work and and was very keen to work with him again. So, so that's how the commission came about. And of course, being attached to somebody who is obsessively interested in music and literature of the First World War had a little bit of an influence. <laughs> so we, we spent a lot of time thinking about what kind of shape such a piece might take. But of course, once you commission a work, it's nothing to do with us. We hand it over to Anthony and it, it's his inspiration, his vision. But I was very happy to advise in the very early stages, along with, with other historians and other people who have opinions on such matters. There are poems that mean a great deal to me. I was also particularly interested, as I mentioned before, this idea of broadening the canon of what we see as literature, 
to do with the First World War. I was working at the time on fragments and newspaper articles and postcards and some miscellany of war, different voices, and also you know, across languages, across cultures. So I made some suggestions of texts that I particularly adore. Um, so Helen Thomas, the wife of the widow of the poet Edward Thomas, who was killed in 1917, wrote the most heartbreakingly glorious, understated, beautifully poetic memoir commemorating Edward, but also working her way through her own breakdown after his death. And so Anthony has t taken uh, one of the most lovely parts of that and, and augmented it enormously, setting it to music, taking the little call that, that Edward Thomas used to, to summon any of his family. He would always be tramping through the woods and through the fields, and so he would call cooey, cooey, and that's how they knew he was, he was coming. And you find that, that echoing throughout the particular moments of Gallipoli to the Somme. And, it, and it's, of course, utterly heartbreaking because we know he isn't coming and it, it is goodbye, it's not hello. And, but it's very beautifully done and it's testament of what you can do when you are able to inhabit a text and and stand within the the writer's consciousness and give it that added layer of meaning and added layer of resonance that the music provides. Anthony, Kate nudged you in the direction of one or two texts, but can you talk yeah. us through a bit more about the construction of the libretto, the choice of texts? So Alexander Aitken's uh, memoirs lie at the heart of the oratorio, the oratorio tells his story up to a point, but you have woven in a range of other texts and other voices. So can you talk us through that and, and give us a bit of an outline of the plot of the oratorio? Uh, yes, it's in a tripartite structure, so and, and it's roughly chronological. So the first part is called The Parting, and then the second part is called Fighting, and then the third part is called Grieving. And uh, my, my concept for the work was that it was sort of like slices of life from uh, lots of different people's experiences. So I wanted to bring together quite a disparate group of texts to try and sum up some of the ordinary people's experiences of life. So taking up Kate's point earlier on, it's not just the highbrow poets, there's all sorts of soldiers, ditties, the bells of hell, you know, the airmen's ditty included in there. There's even a text that's not poetry, it's prose. And in fact, Aitken's text is all prose, and I've made those more like sort of recitative, I suppose. But there's also a plan of battle that's included in the text and sung for a particular purpose. Yeah, Aitken, I guess, is the glue that holds it together. And for that reason, I used the solo violin as a sound, a signifier, I guess, to symbolise Aitken. So the very first sound we hear of the piece is, in fact, the solo violin playing by itself, uh, and which then weaves its way through the piece periodically. We have a text in the first part that is a, a Maori war song, because, of course, New Zealand's a bicultural nation, in fact, World War I was the first war where, where Māori uh, were allowed to fight. Previous to that, they were, weren't permitted, so they weren't in the, involved in the Boer War on racist grounds, of course. So the first uh, Māori contingent, I uh, included a text there, which is a, like a war cry. And this war cry, uh, the music for that also recurs through the oratorio three other times. But each time it happens, it's in a different context. So uh, the, the next time we hear it is at Gallipoli uh, with a text by Pat White, which is a very visceral text of all, a list of basically of all the ways to die. And then further on, the battle music signifies Aitken's, the time he got wounded in the Somme. And further on, still the last time it occurs, we have the text by uh, Stram, the German poet, to describe the trauma he went through. I've tried to have recurring themes through the, through the oratorio to, to bring together all these disparate elements of text. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So a mix of voices and the opening is wonderful with this lyrical violin that starts us off. And then the contrast, as you say, with this Maori warrior song, a chorus. Mm. And that already sets us off on this idea that there is this sort of a multiplicity of voices and perspectives and nationalities as well. As you said, you've got German song mm. and so on coming in. But yes, this, these threads that weave through it. We, we will listen to a little bit in a minute, but I just wonder if you can give us some pointers before we listen about the musical styles that you adopted. What kind of things influenced your style choice? Were there other musical influences, perhaps responses to World War I that you either wanted to echo or wanted to avoid? 
you know, maybe you can just give us some kind of key ideas about of, of the way you set these words to music. Yes, well, uh, I've long loved uh, Britain's War Requiem f from an early age. I listened to it till the record got worn out. Um, and uh, it's a fantastic piece. But I knew I just had to avoid that as a precedent uh, because otherwise it would, there's no way you can compare with that fantastic piece. So quite early on decided I wasn't going to use a religious text. Uh, I wanted this to be a more humanist based piece so there's no latin there's no like religious component to it the style of music too that i wanted to adopt was simple and direct this is actually the way my musical style has been going anyway in recent years but i really wanted to set the words so that people could hear them to me that was really important and in some settings of requiem masses and so forth it's quite hard to hear the words put it simply that so i deliberately chose a quite a syllabic style the Helen Thomas poem that Kate mentioned before, The Farewell, I just have the soprano sing it unaccompanied, very syllabic, so you can hear the text. It means that people can appreciate the beauty and the poignancy of that text. Uh, every now and then I allow myself a little bit more uh, artistic license, but I, what I wanted to avoid was the work becoming overly artful. I wanted somehow that, to capture the, the visceral experience of war, so that I wasn't trying to beautify it. I was just wanted it to be sort of a bit warts and all. So from my perspective, anyway, the music's relatively direct and simple. And for that reason, I also wanted to bring in the vernacular voice. So I've used quite a number of existing pieces of music to weave into the work at various stages for particular effect. So we're going to start by listening to a small bit of this, um, the journey to Gallipoli. And then, Anthony, it would be fantastic if you could tell us a bit about what you were trying to do with that music. So that's the Dunedin Symphony Orchestra conducted by Simon Over uh, playing the fifth part of part one, the journey to Gallipoli. And Anthony, can you talk us through what you were doing there? Because I think listeners might have recognised a folk tune in that. It starts off before you, you started that extract. Uh, Aitken has uh, just been saying how odd he found it that he's heading off to Gallipoli and uh, they're sending off the troops with the brass band playing. And then the brass band head back and, and don't go on to battle with them. And he thinks it's very odd that just because someone can play a trumpet that they don't go to battle. <laughs> he muses on this slight odd thing. And that sort of gave me a cue, I guess, to use some brass band-like music to symbolise his journey. 
And here I've used, I've actually quoted a, a New Zealand composer called Alexandra Lithgow, who is quite well known for his marches, his old military marches. And so it's, it's a military piece that's called the March of the Anzacs. And Lisco wrote quite a lot of jolly war music. And if you look through, I did quite a bit of research in the Hocken Library. There's a lot of uh, patriotic songs and jolly marches written during the First World War to keep the spirits up and to say how wonderful things were and how brave they were. And of course, the reality was some, somewhat different. And so I wanted to point make this point, you know, that here there was this jolly march, they're all going off uh, to a really horrific situation where they haven't got a hope of you know, all this sort of the, the futility of it all. So that march gets contrasted and sort of taken over by the sinister strings you can hear creeping in chorus. And what the chorus is singing is they're singing uh, Quinn's Post, Hill 153, the uh, features of Gallipoli that they see as the ship's just moving in an uncover of darkness. And so the music becomes very sinister and segues into the battle at Gallipoli, which is the bit we you heard just when we stopped. It's a symbolic way of describing his journey to the battlefield at Gallipoli. It's a, it's a very powerful moment and one of many it prompts me to think about what music can offer that we find harder to to achieve in just writing or just sculpture I and mean, obviously not just but you know what i mean that this mm. possibility of foreshadowing and undercutting which music does brilliantly in a sense we almost take it for granted you know there, there are operas like britain's turn of the screw where he can make a character appear sinister before they've even come on stage just by using their music and planting the idea of them being associated with evil in our minds and then we see them on stage and we're not even quite sure why we suspect them, but we do. And what Anthony's able to do here, which is a wonderful opportunity for composers, is to take something innocent or something upbeat or something that ought to be okay and transmute it into something else and load it with associations that aren't necessarily needing to be spelt out. It reminds me of a piece that uh, I heard very recently by a trombonist called Dan Jenkins, who's in the BBC Symphony Orchestra, who's written a piece about the bombing of Hiroshima, which he's called 6845. 5815, which is the, the date and the time of the, the bombing in, on the 6th of August. And he does something very, very similar where he takes a, a children's sort of a children's song, a traditional Japanese children's song, and it's lovely and it's all it's light and chirpy and it sounds very much like the March of the Anzacs. And then we hear the sound of the plane coming over, written th through the brass. Um, and through percussion, of course, we know what that signifies, and then it, then it's silence, and then it's chaos. And so, something about that temporal movement, but set up by something very innocent, very pure, that can be undercut by that kind of the same sort of sinister sounds that that Anthony's created here, as the, as the boats sort of slink in alongside the the, the shore and the, under the cover of darkness, very much like that plane coming across. And it strikes me that that's something that only really can happen in music. The other thing that I was really struck by as well is the imbalance of forces, which is a feature of the experience of trench warfare, that you are very small and very vulnerable and liable to be blown up. And the forces stacked against you are enormous and industrialized mm. and utterly terrifying. And the way that Anthony begins the piece with the solo violin that is so fragile and so vulnerable versus the size that he can get to when it's full orchestra really going for it with all the percussion and the choir tanking it out. You know, it's <laughs> is utterly overwhelming and, and there are moments where he will pit the violin against the orchestra which is fantastically powerful mm. and, and, and terrifying to listen to and then again take it right back so that we have just the voice of Helen Thomas just the, just the, um, the soprano soloist with very little un underneath because how much less it would be if he had to tell us that she is vulnerable and alone and fragile and one facing many so it's something that music can do without us even being aware that it's happening Absolutely, in this sense that the violin is Alexander Aitken and like the soprano solo is we're able to zone in on the, on the individual but also see the sort of the massed ranks and the mass momentum. So Anthony, with one section of the orchestra with the brass in that piece that we've just listened to, you manage to conjure multiple forces because obviously the forces of war coming in at the end, clashing, discordant and so on. But before that, the forces of propaganda and the forces of myth-making and and the enthusiasm and the self-delusion, uh, the collective self-delusion, which your music then slowly undercuts um, with deep irony, sort of really subverting that kind of upbeat, jovial mood of the march. 
that's how the first section of the oratorio ends. Mm. And really, there is a strong sense in, you know, in just that piece we, we just listened to, that small snippet of a sense of journey, journey of learning as much as a journey geographically across space and, and across time. And then we get to part two, fighting. And I wondered if there were any bits of fighting of part two that you particularly wanted to, to bring out. It's quite a long section. Um, just following on from what Kate said before, I, I was very aware of the trying to pit the forces of a human being against the might of the war. It's something that really got hit home for me when I visited a museum in Ypres. The, uh, the horrible military devices that they had to kill people were just extraordinary. And so I included a bit from Martin Gilbert's book about the history of the First World War, uh, which might seem a bit odd to do, but um, it's a passage which a, a captain uh, of, of the army, it, it's 1914 in fact, and he, he creates this picture of a lovely summer's evening in France, the sun's setting and people are just having fun and eating, and all of a sudden there's this, uh, the horizon bursts into flame and there are bombs, and it's, there's this moment where he realises that it's not just plain old fighting anymore, it's something beyond a human scale, and so I try to make that point about the nature of fighting changed, you know, in the First World War. There's also in Aiken's war, he, after the Gallipoli, he went to the Somme, and I've tried to recount his experiences there uh, by use of a song, Viva La Company, which is in the context, he's gone to a, the briefing about what, what the battle plan is with his mates, and it's all very orderly and you know it sounds very logical and you know like they'll get to their objective and do whatever uh which he knows full well that doesn't reflect what will actually really happen but anyway after that a person suddenly says you know why don't we have a sing-along and so they they all get down to sing and Aitken describes this moment he says well you know new zealanders weren't necessarily the most singing of people you know it's not the most sort of vocal culture but here they were they got down and sang uh, these old songs uh, they were old even by the time of the first world war so viva la company which most people wouldn't know and then he just makes the comment that uh, little does this, the group know but most of the the singers would be dead in three days time you know it's a very poignant moment I think and um, so one that I tried to capture in music uh, by representation through the for the chorus Viva La Company. This is a moment where we sort of we move between individual voices chorus then and as the Viva La Compagnie gets going and burst into song the voices start to fall away don't they to reflect that sense that uh, actually as the battle unfolds that people will die. Yeah. So this bit is preceded by a baritone solo at zero time, which is where the, the baritone sings the sort of the military plan that Alexander Aitken and his mates have just been given for how the battle yeah. is meant to go. And as you say, we then get the, the sing song starting up. Let us will remain 200 yards beyond the objective as long as required. Consolidate. Consolidate. Let every companion now join in our song. Viva la company! Success to each other and pass it along. Viva la company! Viva la, viva la, viva la war! Viva la, viva la, viva la war! Viva la war! Viva la war! Viva la company! A friend on your left and a friend on your right. Viva la company! In love and good fellowship, let us unite. Viva la company! Viva la, 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 vi
It's so powerful, the way the voices fade out, but also, again, that sinister brass comes in with discordant chords that alert you, as Kate said earlier, to, to the irony. You know, you start off with a friend on the left and a friend on the right, and everyone joins in, and the audience, uh, as we were listening, I saw Kate sort of nodding and, and, and swaying <laughs> a bit, and that music is really powerful. It draws it's you in. It's infectious, isn't it? It's a... Totally infectious. And then you cut away, you cut us away as we experience that whole momentum, those forces of propaganda, forces of enthusiasm. And you, with the music, you bring us down to earth with this reality. It's so powerful. Do you know, one of the things that I find perennially so very powerful in what music can do, and you hear it illustrated here, is that in a sense, what works best is when there isn't any music or when music is taken away. And here we're self-consciously made aware of the absence of music because we're aware of the absence of the singers as they fade out one by one. It's the spaces in between and the silences that really speak because the contrast between overwhelming sound and silence in the trenches, in the war, the silence of the armistice, that silent morning where the guns fall, silent, the silence of death, the anxiety around silence and the craving for silence of the overwhelming noise that people describe in ways of being like, like a kind of a blackness or it just, just simply fails words. Those are the areas that music can touch. And here we see this working. You know, I think Arthur Bliss's Symphony on War, as he calls it in 1930, Morning Heroes, which is the work really that inspired Benjamin Britten, has a moment in it where he sets Wilfred Owen at a point where Owen was hardly known by anybody. So it's a poem called Spring Offensive. And it's about going over the top a little bit like um, the text that Anthony um, takes from the, the Soldier in 1914, a sort of spring untroubled rural idyll with the, the bees buzzing in the cornfield and and then the guns start up and and it all goes hideously wrong but bliss sets it to nothing apart from timpani so we have silence and then we're just aware of a tiny bit of a rumble and then we have some kind of rhythmic patterning going on and and it becomes more and more and it's somewhere between a heartbeat and gunfire and and but it is stripped of pitch and stripped of any real discernible rhythm and of harmony or anything that we can hang on to anything structural that would link it to the rest of the piece and that deprivation is what's so extraordinary and so powerful and here anthony's making that work in a different way but it strikes me that that's what music does best. It contains absence in a sense, all, almost like a, a metaphor. The cenotaph near the tomb of the unknown warrior is a metaphor for the containment of absence. And, and, and you can hold silence at the center of music because you can frame it with sound. I mean, silence plays a really important role in, in the work. I, I do have Kate to thank. You know, she's written about that and her writings influence. I also think it's quite poignant too that the old stereotype of the old soldier who never spoke about his experiences, you know, they re remained silent till near death, you know, and that was very common in, in New Zealand. Absolutely, yes. And a different kind of silence, a sort of nostalgia. So Kate mentioned that sometimes we turn to the war poets like Wilfred Owen and Siegfried Sassoon, but we somehow separate the, the popular music of the time. You're wonderfully bringing them together here. When we turn to the war music of the time, we tend to turn to it with this nostalgia for a spirit that was a sort of step up a lip and not necessarily embodying silence as such, but a turning away, a, a refusal to look at the bleaker side of the story. So that's interesting. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the many kind of contrasts that are running through this piece. So part two, the fighting gives us these sort of different glimpses of fighting on different fronts and fighting in different scales and the gap between how people imagine fighting and plan a campaign and think it might work and the appalling reality. And then it ends with a German episode. So we have baritone and soprano solos here. And you've got text from Aitken's book, but also from a range of other poems and texts, much of which written in German. And I wondered if you could why this turn to German text at this point, and obviously also to a very different style of music? Yeah, well, it's interesting, in my experience, at least, pretty well all the war commemoration commemorates our side, if you like, the, the so-called winning side, New Zealand, Australia, Britain, and so forth, France, and so forth. Um, but not, we don't tend to dwell too much on things German. 
And uh, this was brought home to me before even writing the piece. Uh, I have good German friends here and uh, their daughter was at school and came home upset. It was on Anzac Day and uh, she'd been made to feel bad about being German. And it got me thinking, you know, what do Germans do around these commemorations? And it must be harder for them in, in some respects. And so I, I felt quite strongly that I wanted somehow to put our, ourselves in their shoes. And hence I've included a text by August Stram called Shrai, which is, that translates as Scream. And he was on the Eastern Front, on the Russian Front. He died there shortly after writing this poem. And his very expressionist poems are very visceral. And I, so I wanted to include that in this section. I wanted to include a lot of things, so I put them together in a slightly surreal uh, collection of four different bits under the title German Episode. And I I guess I took as my pretext that this is Aitken, he's at the front in the Somme, it's all becoming quite real for him. And he's, he makes all these interesting little observations, like he, he notices a signpost to Ypres as he's driving along. And it sort of strikes a chill in his heart because already by 1916, uh, Ypres was infamous as being death and futility, basically. And it reminds him of Schubert's song, The Signpost, uh, Wegweiser, because he's a very musical, a very musical person, Aitken, and he knows these things. It reminds him of that song, the translation of which basically amounts to, you know, is a path along which I must take from which I will never return. You know, and so to him, this sign is all about death. And it's an excuse for me, I guess, to quote <laughs> uh, Franz Schubert, which I do uh, for the baritone. It's, uh, it starts out as a, a straight quote, but then morphs into my own piece. And in fact, I've tried to use the basic motif, if you like, from the Schubert to weave all the way through this German episode as a sort of a linking device. Alongside it is a quotation from Handel from the death march from his, his oratorio Saul. And this is another of Aitken's experiences at the front. Of course, the two sides were so close together in the trenches, they could hear each other talking on, on some occasions. And so Aitken had this experience of hearing a German from the other trench playing his flute. And he, he recognized the tune. It was this death march from Saul, which he took to be you know sort of black humor on the part of the, the German who played the flute. Um, you know, sort of saying, well, you know, you're going to be dead soon or <laughs> words to that effect. And this struck me as, as a nice thing to include, sort of black humour, which I think soldiers resort to that type of thing in the, in the trenches to just to survive mentally, a bit of humour in those circumstances. And in between that, I've sandwiched uh, the German traditional song, Ich hat einen Kameraden, I had a comrade, which is often played at on commemorations in Germany. It dates from Napoleonic times, but yes, it's just a, a sad commemorative German song. So a real mix of German quotations in there. And uh, mm. again, this sort of mix also of the sublime and the big ideas and the huge concepts and wrestling with the, you know, the, the spectre of Ypres, but also, as you say, the gallows humour and the coping mechanisms, I suppose. We'll mm. listen just to a small bit of a German episode just to mm. give our listeners a flavour. So, Anthony, you've told us a bit about the text that you chose for that, but can you just talk us through the, the musical style that you're adopting there in that opening that contrasts very much with what we've just had in the Vive la Compagnie 
a bit just beforehand. Yes, so I, I've 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 adopted, uh, as I said, I adopted the Schubert uh, motif, but uh, it's woven into my own uh, uh, style, which is uh, quite a simple sort of modal style. So I've tried very hard in, in this episode, and in fact, all the piece to, to use uh, existing music, but in a way that doesn't stick out too much. So it feels like it's part and parcel of the piece. So that I guess that's important just from a stylistic musical point of view to make it feel integrated into the whole it hasn't struck me before that of course it's it's i think probably because anthony's done it so softly and so brilliantly that it is a a miscellany of of other musics as well as as a a patchwork of texts it's so much more obvious in the libretto that you know these these are different pieces of writing woven together in in interesting ways and ways that create a sense of structure but but he is using other people's music as well all the time as we as we've heard and I was just making a parallel in my head to the way that Gurney's writing develops in the asylum, thinking back to the experience of war. So it's war in the memory. And in a sense, of course, we weren't in the First World War, we weren't fighting. We are, in, in some senses, appropriating other people's music and ventriloquizing others' voices. We're giving voice, and that in itself is, is ethically complicated, but it, it isn't our first-hand experience, and we, we simply have to work with that. But what Gurney does increasingly is to create these miscellanies, these sort of sticking in books, as we might call them, bringing together lots of disparate influences, lots of memories, lots of fragments, and creating a whole, a, a sort of, you know, fragments that he might shore against his ruins, that kind of idea. It hadn't struck me before quite how strongly that does correlate with the whole project of Gallipoli to the Somme. And I wonder whether there is something about that, that it's very difficult to find a way of expressing something that is so enormous and so fragmented. And there are as many different musics of the First World War as there are different people to write them or sing them. And so looking back, the only way to actually make anything that coheres or has any sort of universal appeal and isn't a work of personal catharsis because while we are all on our own personal journeys when we create a work like this it isn't our direct experience is to draw in others voices and to hold them together and to curate them almost and i think that for me is is probably really the the strength of this piece that's certainly something that we've seen in uh, the opera that we looked at a few episodes ago, Letters You Will Not Get, Women's Voices from the Great War, this sense that there is a real effort on the part of the librettist and the composer to curate a very wide range of memories and experiences, not just women on different sides of the conflict, but women of colour, women in all sorts of different walks of life. And similarly, actually, it resonates with something that veteran and novelist from a very recent campaign, um, the Afghan conflict talked to us about when he came on the podcast and talked about his novel Anatomy of a Soldier. One of the things that he said was that in any firefight, in any explosive incident or any any piece of contact, no one person involved in that will have the, had the same experience of it. And what he did with his novel was to write every chapter, 45 chapters, from the perspective of a different object. Um, with the idea that you 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 were constantly being asked to look at the same episode recurring or the same conflict um, in the round from multiple perspectives. So it's something clearly, Anthony, that's coming through in your work, partly the work of a historian, as much as a composer who's trying to express different angles and different perspectives. Yes, I guess I had in mind that, but also it's sort of a, a surreal, you know, mixture of memories, I think, I think what Kate referred to in that, in that particular episode. Mm. So part three of the oratorio, Grieving, is consists of just two pieces, um, a piece called Ellen's Vigil, which is a soprano solo, uh, with a poem by Lorna Staveley Anker. And then we end with a chorus piece, but with a soprano solo in it, called the Kemal Ataturk Memorial. Anthony, can you just talk our listeners through your decision to end the oratorio that way, with those two pieces that, again, contrast with each other? Yes, well, I didn't want to wallow because that's not a very Kiwi thing to do. So I wanted a short and simple grieving uh, ending. The Lorna Staveley Anchor poem is interesting because she's not a known poet here. She got discovered a few years ago by a better known poet called Benedict Hall and had her book published posthumously. And she's one of the very few people who've actually written war poems as such in New Zealand. And this particular poem struck me as exquisitely beautiful and, and moving. 
just the, the, the description of a mother who's lost three sons in the war in different battles. And she's, she's spending her days digging into the earth, digging her garden, searching for her three lost sons. It's a very powerful image of post-traumatic syndrome. Yeah, I just wanted to create it, something that was beautiful and, and move people, which then segues into the Atatürk Memorial. And this is a, a text that is written actually on war memorials in Australia and in New Zealand. And it commemorates the, the New Zealanders and Australians who lost their lives in Gallipoli. And it's, of course, written by the, the leader who eventually became the president of Turkey, Atatürk, but he was the general at the time fighting the Kiwis. And uh, it's a very accepting text. Uh, very, uh, He's saying, you know, now your sons have died on, on our land, they become our sons as well addressed to the um, the mothers of those who've died. It's very, very powerful. Despite what one might think of Ataturk himself, it's a very, very moving text. And I thought it had a hymn-like quality, so I tried to set it as a hymn. And the two pieces are connected with this sort of emphasis on the mother's loss and mother's grief, but also the sense of motherland as well, I suppose. Let's just listen to a tiny bit of the end of Ellen's vigil, she starts and ends it, doesn't she, by naming her three lost sons and cu coming back to their names and that loss. And then we hear the chorus singing in unison uh, in, in the Kemal Ataturk Memorial. So again, we move from Ellen's vigil, this solo to chorus and singing in unison, hymn-like. What kind of closure were you trying to achieve there, Anthony, by you, earlier that when you put the oratorio together, you were quite consciously trying not to do anything that sounded sacred, that had a sort of a religious text. This was much more of a humanist oratorio in contrast to Britain's War Requiem, for example. But what kind of closure do you think you achieve with this hymn-like chorus that's singing in unison at this point and taking the individual grief of Ellen into a kind of a more collective focus? Um, yes, well, it's taking her, her grief. Uh, it's the same music that we hear right at the beginning of the oratorio. So it's taking Aitken's violin tune and the, the strings play, putting it into voice. So it's in a way it's weaving back to Aitken's experience as well. The point I wanted to make was that uh, you know, we, we're all people together and we may have disagreements. There's no need to fight. <laughs> and and so it's, I think that the accepting tone of that poem, it's very magnanimous uh, for a country that was invaded to, to say these words. And I think that live and let live, put yourself in other people's shoes, that, that type of acceptance is the crucial thing that would ensure conflicts are avoided in future. So I guess I wanted to end, say, an accepting note. It's not necessarily optimistic, but it's, and it has a, a hymn-like quality in that the, the voices all sing together as you hear, but that sort of creates a sense, I think, of unity of we're all in this together type of quality that I wanted in the chorus without a religious text. And the echo of Aitken's violin at the start reminds us that you've taken us on a journey, a journey through war and a journey to some kind of peace, some kind of resolution at the end. If you were to sum up what you were trying to communicate in Gallipoli to the Somme, 
what is it? I know that you've wrestled with the idea, especially this was commissioned ahead of the centenary commemorations. You've wrestled with the idea of commemoration relative to critiquing conflict, critiquing war. Uh, what what are you what are you trying to communicate? Because this piece will carry on being performed and will continue resonating beyond the the centenary commemorations. Uh, yes, it, it is a critique of war, but it's also and it's a plea for peace, but it's it's also a plea for understanding of people. So uh, accepting the fact that these things happen and that we all have different perspectives on the world and on how to run things. And if we can put ourselves in the shoes of people back then and what how they saw things, and not just the perspectives of the soldiers, but the perspectives of women and children and others, uh, then we might have stand a better chance of avoiding conflict. Yes, I, I guess for me, that's the main purpose of the piece. Kate, I know that you have thought a lot about remembrance and commemoration through music. Where do you see Antony's oratorio fitting in that kind of larger tradition? I think there is a line that can be traced even back from Gurney writing songs in the trenches themselves as, as the bombs and the shells are falling. I think there are different approaches. As we said, this is a humanist work and we don't have an, an in paradisum at the end. It's not a requiem. It isn't shaped with the promise of eternal life. It's shaped with, with that attack reaching out a hand effectively to these grieving mothers. So I think there is an ongoing lineage and there will be there will be, you know, well into the well into the future, I'm sure, of pieces interpreting war from the perspective of its times. I think that that's one of the things for me as a historian, a cultural historian of this period, that what we see is that music acts as a barometer for the times. So the music that people want in 1916 is not the music that they want in 1918, and it's not what they want in 1922, etc, etc, etc. And so what Anthony's created here is something that speaks of us and to us in 2018. Now, I would be fascinated to see what somebody writes in 2050, because it will <laughs> be part of this chain, it will it will hold its hand back through the past to, to Anthony's work, but it will be something else. And that's absolutely right. And that's, that's how it should be. And that's what what is so perennially fascinating, I think. And can you tell us a little bit about how audiences have responded? I mean, it's, you know, this oratorio has received critical acclaim um, and it's had multiple performances in, you know, different parts of the globe. Has it had similar responses in London, say, compared to um, New Zealand? Yes, I would say they're reasonably similar. The interesting thing for me was in Oxford and London, there were military people in attendance uh, at both performances. And uh, I, t I spoke to two or three of them afterwards, one including a, a man who was blinded at, in Iraq. And he said something that was very important to me that the work really struck a core with him and re reflected something of his experience, uh, which really blew me away, to be honest. I, I, I thought that was amazing. And um, in New Zealand, uh, I've had several older people come up to me and and say, you know, that it, it moved them and that, that it meant something quite deeply to them. Although one old man said, have you actually been to uh, the Somme? And <laughs> wanted to know what I'd actually been over there, and, uh, which spurred me to actually go and have another look. I had been there once before, but, but I went back in 2018. And just to come back to a point we were talking about earlier, the centenary commemorations obviously spurred many different forms of commemoration. So we had Peter Jackson, for example, uh, who you mentioned earlier, Anthony, colorizing old film footage mm. and bringing that to life. Many, many documentaries, all sorts of other engagements with literature and so on. Hey, can we come back to the role that music specifically can play in not simply commemorating, but shaping our habits of visualizing World War One and, and conflict more generally. Yeah, I mean, it has always played a crucial role in the way that we've learnt to understand the war from this very division, in fact, that we, we talked about briefly earlier between popular music and classical sort of highbrow music. And this was set up really very consciously by the BBC, in a sense that, that very quickly after the end of the war, a tradition was formed called the Festival of Remembrance, which happens at the Royal Albert Hall in London as a way of marking Armistice Day. And, and this started off being almost a, a kind of a seance. It was the hall was stuffed full of ex-servicemen and women, many of whom were only very recently decommissioned. 
and they all sang trench song and it was quite bawdy and it was raucous and it was a it was a party and a celebration and, and outside there was armistice jazz going on and, and quite quickly the bbc became uncomfortable with this and they decided that they were going to link up with the church of england and step in and tell us how we ought to experience the war how we ought to remember the war through music so they decreed that it would become Elgar and it would be be Brahms and it would be Requiems and it would be all very sort of sedate and there would be no trench song etc etc and so you find these patterns emerging through memos and through archives of, as to how music ought to play a role in in shaping our remembrance and then over the next decade or so big works of classical remembrance start to be created with John Fould's A World Requiem which is the most extraordinary piece um, written between about sort of nine 1919 and 1922-ish, that is for about 1,200 performers. It was an enormous great piece that was problematic in all sorts of ways, apart from its size, and, and ended up dying a death. But again, that was supposed to be an annual work of commemoration that would be something that we would have indelibly associated in our cultural memories with the war. So music has been appropriated by different bodies of authority. It's been used spontaneously. It's been, it's changed in people's memories music that was too painful to contemplate becomes something terribly precious 10 years on and so forth and of course that's not even touching on the ways in which music has always been used to commemorate it's the spaces for it in any memorial service whether it's of someone who's died in conflict or not that the fact that it, it can hold our thoughts without signpointing us in the direct way that language does and it can be a space for reflection and it can be a space for contemplation that can be both private and shared collectively with the community around you whether that's an audience or a congregation or just people standing over a grave. There's something inherent in what music is and the way that it functions and the way that it works within a community that lends itself to commemoration and lends itself particularly to thinking about war. But it's a very complicated and, and checkered history and it depends who's in control really as to, to what is used for, to remember and what isn't. And it's infinitely malleable as we've seen with Anthony's work. So there, there are all sorts of trends and powerful trends and, uh, and um, authoritative pressures that channel musical commemorations in certain directions at times. Uh, and yet it's also a form which can be used to explore and to expand our understanding and expand our perceptions and our perspectives. Kate, I think you have a poem by Siegfried Sassoon about music and commemoration, is that right? Yes, I do. It's rather a nice way of, of rounding up, perhaps. It's a poem called Dead Musicians, which is a rather unpromising title, but I think he's doing, <laughs> he's doing that deliberately. Um, and it's written in 1918, so it's, it's not actually after the end of the war, but he's already starting to think to project into the future as to how his changing relationship to music is linked indelibly to commemoration and to the pain of war and the trauma of war and how it can express it and how it can fail to express it. And so it, it feels to me that it, it's a very apt prophecy really as to the very beginnings of this complicated relationship to music that we've been thinking about. Dead Musicians by Siegfried Sassoon. From you, Beethoven, Bach, Mozart, the substance of my dreams took fire. You built cathedrals in my heart and lit my pinnacled desire. You were the ardour and the bright procession of my thoughts toward prayer. You were the wrath of storm, the light on distant citadels aflare. Great names, I cannot find you now in these loud years of youth that strives through doom toward peace. Upon my brow I wear a wreath of banished lives. You have no part with lads who fought and laughed and suffered at my side. Your fugues and symphonies have brought no memory of my friends who died. For when my brain is on their track, in slangy speech I call them back. With foxtrot tunes their ghosts I charm. Another little drink won't do us any harm. I think of ragtime, a bit of ragtime, and see their faces crowding round to the sound of the syncopated beat. They've got such jolly things to tell, home from hell with a blighty wound so neat. And so the song breaks off, and I'm alone. They're dead. For God's sake, stop that gramophone. That's a very powerful poem, which touches on so many of the things that we've been talking about today, the capacity, but also the limitations of music to express and to uh, articulate the complexity of the experiences that people go through in conflict. 
Kate and Anthony, thank you for a really fascinating discussion. Anthony, it's been wonderful getting to know your oratorio, Gallipoli to the Somme. And the clips that we heard, as I said earlier, were performed by the Dunedin Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Simon Over. Listeners, if you want to listen to the whole oratorio, you can actually find it on YouTube. Google Gallipoli to the Somme, Anthony Ritchie, and you'll turn it up. I heartily recommend it. Uh, but Anthony, you've taken us on a fantastic journey, a really, really interesting journey that the oratorio has certainly got me looking with fresh eyes at World War I and thinking more generally about the power of music to help us understand and visualize and imagine conflict in the future as much as in the past. So thank you and thank you Kate very much for your contributions and for introducing listeners if they haven't come across him before to Ivor Gurney, Dweller in Shadows. Thank you, Alice. It's been a very great pleasure and yes, wonderful to you. talk to you, Anthony. Thanks, you, and it's lovely to lovely to talk to you both. And thank you, listeners, for joining us again. Do keep tuning in to the Visualising War podcast. As I mentioned earlier, next week we're going to be staying with representations of World War I when we talk to curators at the Imperial War Museum in London about the ways in which they've decided to update their World War I galleries in 2014 and about the role that museums themselves play in mediating our understanding of historic and contemporary conflicts. So do join us again for what promises to be another very interesting episode. If you'd like to support our project, please share and subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or whatever platform you use so you don't miss an episode. And please do leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps people find the show. Our theme music was composed by Jonathan Young. The show was mixed by Zafir Girton. Thank you very much for listening. Mm-hmm.